thank you very much. Um, I suppose I should welcome you all to the second um, public meeting by the Black Jewish Alliance. Um, the Black Jewish Alliance is a group, a collective that was formed by um, Black Jews, um, non-Black Jews, and wait, Black Jews, non-Black Jews, no, Black Jews, non-Jewish Black people and non-Black Jews. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we formed a couple of years ago, um, partly out of needing to provide cultural space, particularly for Black Jews in the community, um, amongst our comrades and friends who were having a hard time in um, mainstream Jewish spaces, but also as we were noticing a lot of divisive kind of rhetoric that was dividing Black and Jewish communities and pitting uh, black and Jewish communities um, against each other um, and we've been doing a lot of organizing around Palestine over the last few months um, and seeing our membership grow in that time um, but yeah we're so happy to have you Morgan to come and speak um, on a lot of your organizing with Jewish Voice for Peace um, we're really so excited and blessed to, to have you join us and um, the organizing that we've seen Stateside has been an absolute inspiration. Um, and yeah, I think what some of the conversation that you know we'd like to have, I think would really help us as we're kind of trying to build um and a kind of Jewish anti-racist coalitional movement around Palestine, but more broadly than that, like anti-racist and anti-colonial struggle here in Britain. I think you would have so much to share practically politically um as we're as we're doing that and yeah I mean with that internationalist frame of mind um I wanted to like kind of kick off because I'm always just personally quite interested and I always think it can provide really great context as well to understand what brought you to radical politics what brought you to anti-racist politics like what radicalized you like what was that spark that happened for you? Um, <clears throat> thank you so much. I'm, I'm really, I just feel really grateful that we get to have this conversation today and really inspired by the work of the Black Jewish Alliance. And it was so cool to meet um, some folks from BJA and Sisters Uncut when I was, when I was um, in London about a month ago or, or so. Um, so I'm just really grateful to continue learning from your all's end as well. Um, yeah, um, I think what got me into radical politics was, and what really radicalized me was um, um, abolition and really learning about the, the the history of incarceration in in this country, in the U.S., and its relationship to slavery, and the sort of long long histories of struggles against white supremacy. Before I was kind of engaged, learned about that, I was I was in kind of like um, queer LGBTQ kind of like activism, which at, when I was in high school, which which I would say I'm grateful for that period. And also like, it wasn't, I, I wasn't making all the connections between how all of our struggles are connected. Um, so I really got radicalized um, when I learned about the movement to abolish prisons and police um, and the history of black liberationists and particularly black feminist liberationist movements to um, abolish those systems. And that really transformed my whole understanding of what is queer politics and what is feminist politics and um, really transformed my whole life and really set me on this journey that I do think eventually led me towards Palestine solidarity and the movement for Palestinian liberation. Um, yeah, so really working with, with groups like the Sylvia Rivera Law Project in New York and the transgender, gender variant, intersex justice project in, in the Bay Area, um, working with um, trans and gender nonconforming people who are in prison and incarcerated and learning about their leadership and their work to challenge those conditions. That really is what blew my mind and set me on the path that I've been on. Yeah, that's really, that's really um, amazing. And I think it's kind of really interesting that you know what brought you into like kind of like radical ways of thinking about politics was um around abolition and i think that's probably true of a lot of people especially in recent years 
and the kind of two, you know, huge street uprisings that we've had in recent years, like in 2020 was around Black Lives Matter after the murder of George Floyd, uh, George Floyd, which had brought a lot of people into abolitionist kind of ways of thinking. And then more recently, you know, seeing the huge numbers of people coming out on the streets um, for Palestine and for anti-imperialist politics. And I find that's quite interesting that those there have been two quite seismic times that has brought huge, unprecedented numbers of people um, out on the streets um, 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 and and into movements. And I wonder how you see abolitionist politics and 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 um, organising for the liberation of Palestine as connected. Um, yeah. Yeah, I I think they are inextricably connected in their DNA in on every single level. They're connected both in who we're fighting against and also who's with us as we fight um, and what we're fighting for. Um, you know, the history of Black and Palestinian solidarity is deep and rich and so powerful and such a guiding force in reminding all of us that our liberation, our struggles are internationalist um, and that our, the, the systems that are oppressing Black communities, Palestinian communities are cross borders, transnational, um, that, the, that the literal material structures of the prison and police state and the Zionist colonial apparatus are overlapping. There are so many of the same companies, so many of the same comp literal companies are building the walls mm -hmm here in the US-Mexico border are literally contracted to be sharing surveillance technology. Um, the, the prison and police industrial complex, um, you know, is deeply connected to the military industrial complex. So we have, a, we have an entire global economy that's premised on caging and killing people deemed disposable. Um, mm. So the movement for abolition and the movement for Palestinian liberation is aimed at the same system. Um, it's a system that believes in cages and in borders and in walls and in cops and in bombs. Mm. Um, and and be, be, beyond the fact that those systems are deeply connected inextricably, what abolition teaches us is to is that the state can never solve our our wounds. The state cannot, um, that, that aging people and that building up um, carceral apparatuses doesn't create healing for anyone, but actually creates trauma for everyone. And for me, I, you know, I came into abolition really through um, queer and trans people who were teaching me we need to not let hate crimes laws, we need to not believe that hate crimes laws will actually solve homophobia and transphobia. The idea that longer prison sentences somehow, which we know that any laws that strengthen the criminal legal system always target poor, and pe poor people and people of color disproportionately. So, you know, I was brought into this movement to say, stop using our grief, stop using our pain as queer people, stop using our death as queer people, stop using our fear as queer people as a justification for more cops, for more rainbow flags on cops, for more prison beds, for more rainbow flags on prison doors. No, don't, don't use us. And similarly, I got really brought into this movement by radical domestic violence advocates who said, don't use domestic violence as, as, a, as a premise to build up policing in, in prisons and, you know, stop. Um, and that same belief that, that we need to reject the state's attempts to exploit and weaponize and co-opt our grief and our suffering and our pain and our fear and our anger is exactly what also inspires me to work for Palestinian liberation and to advance Jewish anti-Zionism and to reject Zionism itself as a colonial racist ideology, which is a, which is a false solution to European anti-Semitism, 
that then somehow punishes Palestinians for a problem they did not create. So, you know, these two struggles are deeply connected and they're both inviting us to imagine a world beyond state violence. Mm, I love that. That is, that is, yeah, that is deep. And like, I'm just thinking, especially that what you were, uh, where you started in terms of the interconnectedness of um, these systems across borders um, is something that myself and my my comrade and my best friend and um, co-author Shanice McBean, um, we wrote um, Abolition Revolution together and we talk about the kind of roots of the criminal justice systems being in empire, like policing systems were first brought to Ireland, Britain's oldest colony, um, and you know, even when the the south of Ireland liberated itself, where did the the black and tans, the Royal Irish Constabulary, go um, after after liberation? Many of them ended up in Palestine, using the same techniques, the same um, you know same strategies of policing of control that are still being used today, that but ultimately have their roots in in the British Empire and the. British Empire spread those techniques and those strategies of policing all around the world and that 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 legacy still stays today and I think it's really you know I think it's really important to remember that you know the people that we're fighting against they communicate their their strategies are are, are across borders and so you know in terms of how we're going to dismantle that, ha that has to be internationalist. That can only ever be an internationalist project. Um, I think that's so, so, so important to uh, kind of, and the way you frame that is so, so, so important. Um, I want to kind of pivot to your work with Jewish Voice for Peace. Like, tell me how you got involved. Um, like, what's your, what's your, what's your story there? Yeah. Well, I um, I first got participated in a, my first Palestine solidarity action in 2008. And I remember that moment because my friend Becca recruited me to participate. And I remember my first reaction was, I don't know enough. Like I know about prisons and I know, you know, like I, I'm over here doing this kind of LGBT work. And I thought I didn't know enough to participate in an action around Palestine. And I'm so grateful that my friend Becca said, you do know enough because mm -hmm. you're seeing bombs dropping and you're seeing tanks destroying, bulldozers destroying homes. Like we know enough and they want us to think we don't know enough. They want us, they, they want us to believe that lie that somehow if we don't know every single name and date, we can't oppose colonialism when we see it and we can't oppo oppose racism when we see it. Um, so I always give Becca credit and I think we have to be that person for each other. For new people, we have to say, come on, you know enough, let's go. And mm -hmm. in 2008, um, it was, it was uh, right before um, one of Israel's many assaults on Gaza in which people were pouring out into the streets. And it was also the um, 60th, uh, I'm sorry, 240. I'm sorry, 50th anniversary of the of the um, no, no, 60th anniversary of the creation of the state of Israel. And so mm. what, what I was recruited into was a disruption of a Jewish mm. celebration, because for so many Palestinians across the world, they're mourning the Nakba. They're mourning the mass displacement and mass exiling and mass murder of Palestinians. And somehow there's other people, Zionists, who are celebrating. And so I was I, I'll never forget. It was a very transformative moment to to um, to say to use our bodies as Jews and and say no no celebration in our names we 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 refuse to let this celebration go on um, so that's really where I got and that was in the Bay Area and that's really where I got involved in anti-Zionist Jewish organizing um, through a group called the International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network and you know learning so much and learning that as Jews. We, our bodies are being used as moral cover for a colonial regime. 
that our identities and our tax dollars and our family histories are being used. And that pissed, pissed me off. Like that pissed me off because I, I also was so angry about how queer people were being used to justify these kind of conservative policies like marriage and military, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, we, we just wanna be good citizens, you know? And so I was pissed about that. And then I became pissed about this other thing. And up until that point, I didn't know, I didn't know that there was a Jewish anti-Zionist history. I didn't know, I, I grew up thinking, you know, like I feel fortunate because I wasn't one of the, I wasn't a person who was deeply programmed into Zionism. And I think that's a whole different journey for people who have to really deprogram, like, you know, they were sent on trips and they, you know, like I was sort of programmed in the, in the liberal Zionist way of like, it's complicated and there's violence on both sides. So I had to unlearn that, but I think it's also really important for me to just to be transparent. I didn't have to unlearn so many lies that so many of us are taught, but I was taught nothing beyond it's complicated. And so bringing into that community, I sort of, it changed my whole world. Oh my God, there's a, there's a lineage of radical Jews who like me don't wanna be on the side of oppression. And that means they are with Palestine. So that began my journey. And then a few years later in 2013, when I moved to New York, I got involved in the Jewish Voice for Peace New York City chapter. Um, and that was right before yet another of Israel's assaults on Gaza in the summer of 2014, which like now was a moment when so many of us were like outraged and felt powerless and took to the streets. And I've really spent the past 10 years of my life with the most beautiful, brilliant people getting to um, organize together and learn from our elders and learn from our younger comrades. Um, about how to do principled solidarity in which we say not in our names and we join the global movement for, um, like you said, it's not just about Palestine, it's about ending white supremacy of all kinds. And we recognize that Palestine is a central part of that struggle. So yeah, it's been it's been um, uh, the greatest honor of my life to get to um, to be in this community with people. That's really, really beautiful. And I think, yeah, I think I, you know, appreciate your reflections around not being the the kind of person who was really um, inducted into like deep Zionist ways of thinking. And I, I, I that's that's true of me also. And I, I think that's a real benefit. And I count myself very lucky to have had some contact with my Jewish heritage um, that was quite, you know, um, not necessarily, you know, my grandma lives in Israel and I would visit her and she kind of left out a lot of the Zionist ideology, <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? And I didn't see her that often. And so that, that gave a lot of space to to learn and not have to unlearn in that way, um, that, which is something that I do think has been really beneficial. And I think, you know, I try to give a lot of grace to people who have gone through like a such a deeply Zionist kind of like um, education like from a very, very young age, um, because, you know, I probably would be really different if I had gone through that, of course. Um, but yeah, I also thought it's kind of interesting that like the, there's this, in all of the politics you're talking about, there's this like pull towards divide and rule kind of like over it's, you know, to do with, um, L, you know, hate crime and LGBTQ like, um, queer people basically being taught that yeah the answer is more more prisons and more like longer prison sentences or domestic violence victims and you know in this case we're talking about the divide and rule of like Palestinians being yeah basically left to you know with with the what is essentially Europe's shame for the holocaust um that had nothing to do with them in this kind of divide and rule like someone's got to benefit at someone else's expense um for, for the the problems and traumas of the world. And, you know, every time we get somewhere, the answer is somehow, you know, it's got to come at someone else's expense, um, which seems to just be this kind of like running theme for a lot of like the connectedness of this and like the establishment's answers to, to, to our problems. Um, 
stuff. Yeah, I want to hear a bit more about um, Jewish Voice for Peace's organising that's been happening over the last sort of th- th- oh, now four months now, because um, you've been doing some amazing stuff. Yeah, um, I'm just so, everything you just said, I'm like, yeah. yes, just deep, deep, <laughs> yes. Um, and that's what they're, that's what they're threatened by is the coalition. Like, that's what they're really, they're threatened by. And you see them, they're losing their minds. They're like, why, why, why would you, if you're not Palestinian, care about Palestine so much, right? Like, it, they're so threatened and they're so baffled by the fierceness of our coalition, which says none of us are free until all of us are free. Um, and that fact that we're making those connections between all of our struggles um, is really profoundly threatening. And I think that is, is the source of our power. Um, so I'm just just so with you. Um, yeah, well, I, I should say, you know, that JVP has been around since the 90s and it's been on its own journey, um, eventually, you know, um, endorsing BDS when BD, when the BDS call came out, the boycott divestment call came out. And then um, some years after that, formally becoming anti-Zionist. And I think that's really important for us just to just to know that that organizations can change and that you can go on a journey and that you can one of the things that I'm really grateful about JVP is that we've, as we've gotten bigger, we've also gotten further left. You know, we haven't mm-hmm. gotten further right. Wow. So um, we, you know, we went through a big process as where, whereas many of the individuals were anti-Zionist, it was a, it, to go through a process as an organization to say, as an organization, we reject Zionism. And that I think is such an important part of what has made our response over the past number of months since Israel's horrific assault on Gaza has begun, has begun that we do it from the orientation of anti-Zionism, that we, we know that history did not start on October 7th. We know that Israel's genocidal campaign against Palestinians and against Palestinians in Gaza didn't begin on October 7th, but that there's a long history that has to do with colonization. And so everything that we, on October 7th, we did our first action. We did our first action on the night of October 7th where JVP New York members marched to Senator Chuck Schumer's house with a banner that read, end US military funding to Israel. And on on that day, there was a, maybe a few days after, there was a big New York Times headline that said the Jewish community sets aside its differences and is united behind Israel. And this obviously horrified us, horrified us, um, and totally mischaracterized the truth, which is that so many of us, New York Jews, Jews, wherever, know that the root cause of the problems in that region are Zionist colonization that create the conditions for this ongoing crisis. And so we, we, we said immediately, how do we put our bodies visibly out and as possible to say, Jews say not in our name, don't use, don't use, don't, don't use the death of Israelis, don't use the death of Jewish people, don't use the fear of the fear of rising anti-Semitism, don't use that as a call for more military violence against Palestinians. Don't use that as a call for more land grabs. Um, And, you know, along with millions of other people around the world, we took to the streets and um, we were like, how do we intervene in a dominant narrative that's saying that they can speak for all Jews, which Israel tries to do. Israel says we represent all Jews. We know that's not true. And then the media participates in that narrative by saying the Jewish community is is united. And we said, no. So how do we intervene and make it very clear that Jews demand a ceasefire, that Jews stand in full and unequivocal solidarity with Palestinian freedom, and that we reject Zionism, that we're not going to use this moment to kind of put forward a very milquetoast kind of solidarity that says, well, you know, we 
well, we don't, we don't want when it's, when it's kids, we don't want kids to be hurt, but you know, it's like, no, no, no genocide, no settler colonialism, no occupation. There's no gray area here. So, um, you know, like we can hold, we've, we've had many JVP members whose, whose family is, have Israeli family and they lost people on October 7th. And we can hold that simultaneously, that grief simultaneously with our un, and as part of our unflinching commitment to Palestine, to Palestinian liberation. And we know that the grief and the sorrow and the suffering that has taken place over these past months is because of that colonial situation. So it's not a contradiction with our politics to, to be, to, to, to grieve anyway, to, to grieve any life lost. It's no contradiction. It's, it's, there's all life is sacred. Every single life is sacred. And the way we defend life is by opposing systems of racial domination that lead towards the premature death of whole populations. So we, you know, had, we organized these demonstrations where we were like, how do we, you know, we, we, are, are, we, we again went to Chuck Schumer's, uh, the highest ranking Jewish politician in the US. We again went to his house and many of us started getting arrested. And then we took over the Senate rotunda, the con congressional rotunda in the Capitol in, 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 in DC. We held, a, we held a, the largest rally ever of Jews in solidarity with Palestine in history. And we, and then we took over the rotunda with, rab with rabbis in the middle and we were chanting and made this big spectacle. And then we did that at Grand Central Station and we shut down Grand Central Station. And I do have to say, one of the people who was at with us at Grand Central Station is Cecilia Gentili, who, who passed yesterday. And she is a, we are blessed. We are blessed to have walked this earth at the same time as Cecilia Gentili incredible trans revolutionary sex worker activist who was right there chanting free Palestine and who was one of the last people to get out of jail that night. And she mm. had a show. She was performing a show the very next night. And maybe, maybe that night that she got out of jail and wow. she was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to be there because trans liberation means free Palestine means migrant justice means sex worker justice. And we, wow. she's gone too soon, but we'll may never let go of her. May her memory be a blessing and a revolution, honestly. Wow. Wow. What, what, lost too soon. <laughs> wow. So much light, so much, she had so much more to do, but we will, we will honor her fierce, joyful militancy with every step. Um, and yeah, so she, so we, there is there is big grief in the world right now for um, for this this loss of Cecilia. Um, um, yeah, but she was right there with us, and she and she was um, she, 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 and that's what we've all been doing over these past months is getting into the street and saying our struggles are connected. Free Palestine. Amazing, absolutely amazing organizing like it's it's inspired a lot of the organizing that's been happening here in the UK um in London and yeah which is why we were so excited to speak to you because this is exactly like what we're trying to build and grow um build those connections between all these all different struggles um and articulate those those connections in a way that perhaps in the not too you know distant past like were harder to grasp for a lot of people organizing you know around anti-racism or around black struggles or around um you know trans struggles around queer struggles like weren't always all that connected and I think that that connectedness is really growing um yeah and like I think I think one of the things that has been quite um I have a couple, a couple of questions around um organizing as Jews particularly in this period but more broadly as well um because i think i think as someone who is a black jew i think I, I sometimes feel slightly outside of which can be quite a good thing in some ways and 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 can kind of look at how um jews who are read as white um kind of see their position with an anti-racist struggle and it's always slightly puzzled me that um, a lot of 
uh, Jews who may be white, may be red as white, see their position more as um, allyship to anti-racist struggle rather than, you know, rather than seeing their like identity as Jews being as part of liberatory politics and liberatory struggle in and of itself. And I suppose that might be because, you know, there's been, you know, a very concerted attempt through Zionism to assimilate Jews, um, certain kinds of Jews into whiteness. And so that becomes quite complicated (laughs) for a lot of people. And I completely get that. Um, But I wonder, you know, given all of that, like, how do you understand the role of organizing as Jews in anti-racist struggle for liberation? Yes, this is such an important question. Um, I think the first thing that I go to is like, our communities are, are already being organized as Jews, but by the right. Like we've been organized for decades um, Jews, Jews obviously historically form a huge, important part of internationalist social justice, social justice struggles, socialist struggles, anarchist struggles. You know, that's that's our historical tendency. Um, and the government of Israel and the Zionist lobby here in the U.S. has done a pretty good job of trying to co-opt so many of us into Zionism and say, this is the, this is our place, this is our place. And um, to really convince so many of us that Israel is a progressive project, somehow even a social justice project, you know, you talk about in your amazing book that I am excited to keep getting through with Shanice, like about carceral feminism. And I think there's so many connections around like how Israel has pink washed itself and green washed and art washed and purple washed, you know, all the used, used so many of our communities and our values to, to mask its project, to mask its, its, its fundamental violence, um, which is not the first time we've seen that happening. Like we see prisons and police do that. We see the U S do that all the time. Um, But um, I think that our communities are being organized. If we don't organize our communities, they will be organized by the right. And that is not something we can sacrifice. We, we, we actually can't abdicate the, that, that ground. We can't cede that ground and say, well, it's, it's either too complicated for us as Jews or whatever. I'm just going to be an individual. It's like, that's, that's fine for individuals. But as communities, we are being organized and we are being spoken for. And we are being recruited. I mean, literally, if you look at the West Bank settlers, so many of them are from New York and from New Jersey. Our literal bodies are being recruited to join the IDF, to to join the settlement projects. And then if not that, to go on these brainwashing trips or to give money to Israel, you know, like, so so we're being recruited and we're being Mm -hmm. spoken for. And even, even in ways when we say, oh, well, this kind of like vague idea of anti-Semitism is, is rising. So we have to support Israel. It's like, wait, spell that out for me. What are we talking about? Are we talking about the growth of white nationalism and fascism? And you think supporting Israel is going to help that? Like, like don't sell me a bill of goods. And, you know, like, like, so, so if we don't organize ourselves, the right will. And the second is that, Israel and Zionism function so much by pretending or saying that they speak for all Jews. And it's really important for us, as many of us as possible to say, you don't speak for me. Because we know that as soon as someone criticizes Israel, they get smeared as anti-Semitic. That conflation has gone so deep between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism and the conflation between Zionism and Judaism has gone so deep, we think it's natural. We think it's real, but it's actually only very historically recent. So our job is to be like, no, Judaism is a thousand year old tradition that is diverse and multiracial and multicultural and global. And Zionism is a European colonial ideology that's only 150 years old that Mm -hmm. was very unpopular amongst Jews 
very yeah. unpopular amongst Jews in the beginning. And we have to we have to bring that tradition forward and say, since the first time Zionism was introduced to Jews, Jews said no. Not all Jews. Some Jews are trying to recruit us into it, but there are many Jews who said no. So um, so we we get to, we get to, we don't have to, but we get to play a role in this movement and a strategic role. And I think what's really important and complicated is that Zionism has created a regime of Jewish supremacy in the land between the river and the sea. And that means that when Jews speak, their words are listened to, our words are listened to more about mm -hmm. Palestine. And that is part of the violence, that is part of the racism, that is part mm -hmm. of the ethnic superiority that this regime has created, that somehow me as an American Jew, my perspective on on the ancestral homeland of Palestinians, somehow my perspective is more important than Palestinians. That is so, so painful and wrong. And we live in this reality when Jews are listened to. And so we have to use the platforms that we have. We have to use the microphones that we have and say not in our name. And we have to recenter Palestinians. So we have a role to play. It's not the most important role to play. It's not the central role to play in, in we're not the protagonist of the global anti-racist struggle or of Palestinian liberation. Mm -hmm. We're not the protagonist, but we are in joint struggle. We are in joint struggle for collective liberation. We know that white supremacy is all of our enemy, even if some mm -hmm. of us get some pri privileges from it at some times, that it dehumanizes all of us and that it's coming to get all of us. And that our everything we want is through solidarity. Everything we want is through collective liberation. So, yeah, and, and, and I think the other thing I would say about just why organize as Jews or what we get to is like, there is so much healing and repair that can happen when people, non-Jews, get to see Jews who are really clear and unapologetic in our solidarity and our anti-Zionism. And it's so powerful to be in the streets together. You know, like it's, we've been sold this story as Jews that we're alone in the world, that nobody cares about us, that our, we are the only ones who have to look out for ourselves. And that's just not true. It's not true and it's harmful and it's racist. And we have to counter that isolationist story by saying our place is in the movement our place is in the streets wow that is yeah like this is like such a important um uh like topic for us at the moment um in black jewish alliance and trying to unpick this particularly when we're like you know this is a coalition organization as part of a wider coalition of Jews as part of a wider anti-racist coalition with all kinds of different um, different uh, groups of oppressed people is where do we position this? And I guess, you know, I, I really liked your point around how the right is organizing Jews and recruiting Jews and the tactics that they use. Because ultimately, you know, I am, you know, in, talk, in terms of my own politics, I'm an anti-capitalist, I'm a revolutionary, and I don't believe that we will be free until, you know, we overthrow capitalism. And for the longest time, Jews have, you know, been positioned in very specific ways within capitalism and continue to. And this is, you know, all part of that. And I can't really envisage a way in which we're able to dismantle that where most of the Jews are on the other side. Fundamentally, like, you know, when... The same, the same, you know, in any kind of uh, community struggle, though, it's no, it's not necessarily different in terms of those dynamics. There are many black capitalists or, you know, reactionaries that I'm also trying to recruit from the other side is extremely important. Do you know what I mean? Like, we're not going to get them all, but we're going to need a lot more. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. And so, uh, you know, for me, it feels like I can't really envisage a way in which we dismantle we dismantle these hierarchies and yeah, Jews have been positioned in a different way in more recent um, decades than maybe they have in the past, but it's still the same kind of 
imperialist hierarchies, giving some crumbs to these people, giving some privileges to these people to oppress these people. It's all the same imperialist um, like ideologies that that have you know been going on for hundreds of years. And so yeah, I think like understanding and unpicking the the role that has been positioned for us by imperialists as Jews and reject like what it's going to take to reject that and what it's going to re- take to recruit more to reject that and how that that really like breaks down you know really loved your point about how much how important it is to do that in order to break Zionism itself like that is such a fundamental yeah. um part of that um yeah and I'll just say one quick thing is that is that Zionism has like you talked about racial formation and how Zionism has impacted Jewish racial formation and part of like what gets what Zionism hides from us is the violence that it has done to Jews you know Mm -hmm. like that particularly if we look at Mizrahi Jews and Sephardi Jews and Jews of color the profound racism and dislocation and exile that Zionism has seeded yeah and the and the racial hierarchy with Ashkenazi, white Ashkenazi Jews at the top that it has created, and that yeah. so the violence that it has done to Jews, and also the violence of it, you know, part of the project of Israel was to say stop speaking Yiddish, start speaking Hebrew. So s- stop with your kind of you know your anti-colonial, anti-racist. You know, we're going to create this this kind of monolith, and so as Jews. Zionism, Palestinians aren't the only people who have a stake in ending Zionism. We do too. It harms us too. Mm, yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I've experienced that in my own family, like the 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 white, you know, side of my Jewish family and the kind of opportunities that they've been given, but that's kind of been at the expense of leaving behind black members of my family. And like, you know, you can go and like make a life for yourself in the state of Israel if you're a white, you know, working class Jew, that's like a really big opportunity for you. But like, then you have to leave behind your black family members, like, and that's what, it, you know, it's just, it's just a whole, a whole mess. Um, I Before I go on to the next um, uh, question, I want to uh, encourage our participants to send through your questions for Morgan, anything like you want to uh, draw out from this conversation or anything that you want to raise please please send through your questions um really want to hear what everyone else has got to say and I can see some of the names of the people and I know there's some some yeah there's some you know people that know a lot there so I feel like you've got stuff to say (laughs) um but yeah I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into um you know, anti-Zionist, um, anti-Zionist Jews, um, and particularly in this moment, I've really noticed, and a lot of us in Black Jewish Alliance have really noticed a massive shift in the last three, four months in the way that anti-Zionist Jews are being spoken about by Zionists um, and with Zionist ideology. There was a point, you know, when anti-Zionist Jewish groups were often referred to as marginal just nothing to you know nothing to see here kind of accepted as Jewish but not important Jews and not really part of the the Jewish community that you need to listen to and now we're seeing a shift to much more worrying language of you know undue um you technically part you're technically part of the Jewish religion but you're a non-Jew or an undue you know, really um, like shocking and quite like fascist language. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of sat here thinking, well, if if Zionism is the project that helps some Jews to assimilate into whiteness and where all the anti-Zionist Jews are getting kicked out of that, then where where does where does that leave the kind of race of of, of anti Zionist Jews and and this kind of quite fascist kind of language that is being used used to describe um, anti Zionist Jews is yeah it's it's been like um, it's it's been really shocking to see and I wondered if you had any reflections on that. I appreciate you using the word fascism. Um... And 
like you you talked about earlier that the forces of police and prisons and border walls they're teamed up fascists stick together fascists stick together so there is it's not a coincidence that trump and netanyahu are best buddies it's not a coincidence that fascists across the world find common cause with each other and our job is to find common cause with anti-fascists around the world. Like that's like, you know, like that's that's our job um, to find common cause um, with anti-fascists and anti-racists around the world. And one of the things that I think crystallizes the absurdity of the U.S.-Israel alliance, or the clear, the, the 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 just the the clear the the, the brazenness of what it is, is that. Israel is really the cornerstone of the evangelical Christian foreign policy in the U.S. And I think, you know, I, I'm not educated enough to know how this stuff is playing out in the U.K., um, to how how Christian Zionism and, and right-wing Zionism. I will say that, you know, Balfour himself was a Christian Zionist. And so this, this history of, of anti-Semitic Christian Zionism, Christian Zionism is itself anti-Semitic. The idea that all the Jews should be rounded up and moved to that land to hasten the second coming of Christ. Like what is not anti-Semitic about this, right? But they will, they will, they'll, they'll profess this out of a professed love for Jews. And so this is one of the ways you see Israel flags at Trump rallies. There was a big Israel march in DC and we saw um, this right-wing Christian pastor, John Hagee, Speaking at it, he's the head of Christians United for Israel, which is just to give a sense of scale, has 10 million members, 10 million members. APAC in the U.S. has 100,000 members. So the Christian, the sort of, Israel is a, there are many Democrats who are siding with Israel, but it's fundamentally a right-wing issue. And so our job is to reveal it as a right-wing issue, to pull the mask off of it as a right-wing issue. And to say, you don't get to co-opt our identities and your love of Jews is false. Your love of Jews is manipulative. Your love of Jews is anti-Semitic. Your, your love of Jews is anti-Palestinian. Um, and so, yes, we are, going to, we are going through a reckoning right now. There's no two ways about it. We are going through a reckoning around Zionism. It's not the first historical reckoning, but we are in one. And that means we are going to get smeared. We already are. We already are. We open our mouths for Palestine. We open our mouths for ceasefire. Mm -hmm. We open our mouths for Gaza. And we are smeared. And this is painful. This is really painful. And we need to let as as Miriam Kaba and other people, we have to let this radicalize us and say this was never our belonging to begin with. Zionism was never real belonging. Coalition with fascists was never real belonging. Our belonging is in people's struggles. Our belonging is in anti-racism. Our belonging is in is in diaspora. Um, and so we are the the more they the more the Zionist Jewish institutions smear us and say we're not real Jews, the more they reveal themselves. The more they reveal themselves that they and their own colonial interests, and the more we get to say, let go. Like mm. we are going to create our own institutions and our own communities, and we're going to reclaim Judaism beyond Zionism. I don't know. I'm curious your answer. To yeah. The I mean, this it's been a really painful time. I think reckoning is a really good word. Um, and th there's aspects to the way in which um, Zionists and, and Jewish communities have responded that have really kind of blown me away. Like people literally being formally kicked out of their synagogues, like, you know, estranged from their families, um, you know, Things that I, you know, even even for Zionists, I've been like, that's that, you know, not being able to be buried with their family, all of these kinds of things where you're like, that's that's a, a whole new level that I did not really expect or see coming. 
and um and yeah there's been some extremely painful conversations and I think you know a few months ago I kind of thought I, I started to think that you know um anti-Zionists were were like even over the, over the last few years were kind of um making much more space um for like especially young Jews um and taking up a bit more space in in Jewish communal spaces and I, I kind of saw that as you know uh, quite positively um that maybe you know that we could be in those spaces and start to have those conversations and in this moment I'm starting to see a real uh split like two very distinct Judaisms are emerging out of this moment which has been extremely painful um I don't know whether you feel like that's what what's happening too but it's it started to feel like the 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 possibilities for us being in those kind of more mainstream spaces and kind of trying to bring ourselves like bring people along with us is it's kind of moving maybe moving away from that you know whether we like it or not um maybe things are different where you are but yeah that's kind of what it started to feel like here yeah i just I appreciate you sharing all that. And my heart goes out to anyone and everyone who has had those painful experiences. Um, and, and that we won't let those experiences, we won't let those exper experiences um, lead us to, to abandoning our commitments to justice. Like we just won't let it, you know, like, um, whatever whatever consequences we are facing as Jews does not compare to the consequences that Palestinians are facing for being Palestinian. And that our, I really do believe, I really do believe that our wholeness and our, our healing and our souls and our dignity is to be found through solidarity, that we actually can't heal, that we actually can't repair, we actually can't fill that spiritual longing in us outside of anti-racist coalition <laughs> like so we got to let those the hard experiences we've had in jewish communities again ripen us and like bring us even more into solidarity mm, amazing yeah i think that's a really important point um to kind of connect what is going on in this moment um with you know yeah anything around how the Jewish communities are like tearing themselves apart in this moment is is yeah obviously you know nothing compared to what is happening in Gaza right now um and yeah I think if anything I found a lot of um like solace and like just sober solidarity from a lot of Palestinian um comrades who who are like yeah this this is really bad and but like you know this is your this is this is your real home like anti-racist struggle is your real home and this was probably always coming and to remember like yeah who whether you're Jewish or not like fundamentally we're in, we are in struggle together and like that is where that, that is where our home is like and have been reminded of that and remembering that is like really fundamental um we have a few questions coming in now um so I think I might um read a couple out um so uh, first one is hello. I'm wondering how to navigate as a Jewish and Zionist organizer, how to be good partners to Palestinians and Palestinian organizations while trying to work with other Jewish communities who are more Zionist and trying to transform them or engage in dialogue with them with the goal of increasing mutual understanding to hopefully getting them more aligned with Palestinian demands. Really great question. Thank you. Someone anonymous. <laughs> I think you're naming, I think this person is naming the central tension of our work, which is how do we move our people in a way that's accountable to Palestinians? Um, because we can be, um, we can think we're being accountable to Palestinians and then not move anybody. And we can also 
think we're moving our people and then totally betray Palestinians. And that's really quite often what happens is that people say, well, they're not ready to hear about Zionism or they're not ready to hear. So we're going to use more watered down language and um, not, not going to talk about BDS and we're not going to talk about, you know, and and we have to hold both at the same time. And that's a tension that I don't know how to do perfectly. And I don't think we know how to do perfectly. I don't know. I don't know if perfection is the, is the goal. Um, I think first and foremost, really listening to what Palestinian organizers are saying. And for us, that has been um, really listening to how important it is for Palestinian organizers to, to ask us to reject Zionism, not just Israeli occupation, not just apartheid. Those are parts of it. The assault on Gaza is part of it. The Israeli apartheid is part of it. Occupation mm -hmm. of the West Bank is part of it. But we've been asked really clearly to educate our communities about Zionism as the root cause. And then within that, and I see, I see um, another similar question of, you know, how do we talk to Zionist Jews? Mm -hmm. One thing is we acknowledge all of us have been on a journey. We did not get born knowing Think, believing what we believe. And many of us, all of us have changed our minds as we came more into contact with Palestinians and Palestinian reality, we changed our minds. And so I think it's really important for us not to have a position of moral superiority that says, you don't know anything, even though we may feel that, you know, we may feel understandably very angry. And it's mm -hmm. not to say we can't let our anger into the work. That's our anger is part of it. But we also have to acknowledge we've also changed. And so one of the things that's really helpful is there's a book that some comrades put out called A Land with a People. And that's mm. stories of Jews and Palestinians um, that started with Jews wrestling with Zionism. And so reading the stories of Jews who've come out of Zionism, who've really been de-indoctrinated, it can be very helpful. Even hearing the stories of of refuseniks, of young Israelis who refuse to join the military. And it doesn't mean they're the most important people in the world who should be, but it's that's that's courageous that we, and we can say, oh, look, that person was born, was raised to believe a different thing. And then they couldn't look away. Um, so I think, I think the other thing that we've learned is that it's not a one size fits all. So it's important to have spaces that are private and educational and cultural and then it's important for us to also show up militant and clear and unapologetic in our politics in the streets and that we can do both. We can have heartfelt, courageous, vulnerable conversations that meet people where they're at and that say, oh, that makes sense. And I once thought that too. And I had to go through a process of unlearning, just like all people have to go through a process of unlearning, especially people with any kind of privilege have to go through a process of unlearning. And we can be militant, unapologetic. There's no contradiction. Um, but I do think people people can smell when you think, when you're talking to them, like um, they don't know anything and they're just fucking, you know, like there needs to be some modicum of, of like respect for a transformative thing to happen, I think. But that doesn't mean we don't be, we be apologetic about our politics. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I definitely find that you know, I've been able, when I've had conversations um, with, you know, family and community, like where I, you know, we don't always see eye to eye, I definitely think actually approaching these conversations from the point of view of like, okay, I'm actually interested in where you're coming from. And like, let's start there. Like, what is, what is your fear? What is the thing that you're concerned about? And let's start there rather than here's a bunch of statistics about how you're wrong it's like okay you're afraid let's talk about that like why do you think that Zionism or police or whatever it is is the answer to that this is like I'm just going to share what I think my answer is like can we have a dialogue about that and like, I've definitely got a lot further with people if you approach it like I'm going to actually respect like where you're coming from even though I don't believe like maybe believe in your answers and your your conclusions I'm going to respect like what your starting point do you know what I mean um and I think yeah I think that is a really important part of this this kind of work as well um I want to read out another question from Maria um I went to an event last night in which a South African Jew former activist in the National African Congress 
he said we are being called anti-Semitic and self-hating, hated, uh, self-hated Jews. We had to simply stop caring about what we are called. But he was also addressing a room of people like myself, non-Jew. What is your recommendation to navigate that area, especially when there is so much criminalization of all of us protesting against genocide? I guess that kind of, I guess, hints at like a bit of a, the way in which um, the accusation of anti-Semitism is so weaponized and where that kind of can leave um, many of us feeling quite defensive, whether Jewish or not. Um, but whether there's also, how do you navigate that when, yeah, that doesn't, you know, the doesn't mean that anti-Semitism isn't happening within our movements. And it can be quite a tricky it's a tricky balancing act. I don't know if you have any re um, reflections on that. Yeah. Um, first of all, just so much gratitude to South Africa. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like um, the clarity of their insistence that what they are seeing and what we are all witnessing is genocide. And what they are seeing and what we are all witnessing is apartheid. Um, I don't think we can overstay. I don't think we'll ever be done saying our our gratitude to South Africa. Um, oh wait, there's more questions coming in. Oh wait, oh no, <laughs> oh, they went away. Okay, hold on. I'm sorry. Um, That's so, okay. Um, um, well, I think a, a couple of things. One is that is for us to know that there's been a concerted, very well funded, well resourced effort to conflate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. And there's a definition called the International Holocaust Remembrance Education Alliance, definition of anti-Semitism that literally calls criticism of Israel anti-Semitic, which is so painful and racist and dangerous and anti-Palestinian. And so first is what we can say, it makes sense that you've heard that. That's a thing that a lot of people are saying. Um, and that's a really well-funded narrative that's going around. And it's being used as a way to cover up war crimes. Mm -hmm. And you and I, we're against war crimes. Like you and I were against genocide. You and I were against apartheid. You and I were against occupation. We're against white supremacy. So it makes sense to be alarmed when someone said, when someone brings up the accusation of anti-Semitism, but now we have to call it out for what it is. And we have to say that's being used to undermine calls for Palestinian freedom and distract from real anti-Semitism. The real anti-Semites are white nationalists. The real anti-Semites are neo-Nazis. The real anti-Semites are right-wing fascists who you know, are peddling anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. That's who we gotta keep our eyes on. That's who we don't wanna be in coalition with. And so, it's okay for us to say, we, we at this point, we, ha we have to say, I, I get that that narrative's out there. We're not even gonna, we're not even gonna meet that narrative. We're, we're, I'm mm -hmm. not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, um, Mohammed Al-Kurd is so good at doing this when he's like, I'm not going, I reject the question. I reject the, the premise of the question. When we're talking about Palestinians' freedom, we're not gonna displace that with false mm -hmm. accusation, with a conflation with anti-Semitism. I'm not being super clear, but um, yeah. And, and, and I think the other thing we can say is that if, we, if you really care about anti-Semitism, you care about ending racism of all kinds and you care about stopping, opposing the right and Zionism is part of the right. Mm, yeah, do, do 100%, you have any? a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think, you know, when the state of Israel was created, that was part of a, you know, wider move to separate Jews from wider anti-racist and anti-colonial struggle. Um, and since that's happened, there has been this kind of separation of like, or like the anti-Semitism is kind of linked with Zionism and, 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 and there's not like that, um, 
connection with other forms of racism, of understanding how anti-Semitism and other form of forms of racism relate to each other, like what the role of anti-Semitism is within capitalism and racial capitalism, what the role of anti-Black racism is within um, um, capitalism and actually understanding the connections between them. I think the state of Israel did, you know, has and Zionism has done a really good job of, of dislocating that history and, and saying, you don't need to understand this in connection with those other struggles. This is his own thing and we just need to focus on Israel. And so I suppose that the kind of like rejection of their way of understanding anti-Semitism is to say, no, anti-Semitism is real. It's really happening. And it is deeply connected to other forms of oppression and racism. And this is how, and this is the history and this is its function and this is how it works. It operates differently from other forms, but it's connected and like, yeah, and I think that's that's got to be part of the coalition building and, um, you know, yeah, that's part of the coalition building work, definitely. Um, yes. there's, there was another really great question here that I think um, is a really great point from another anonymous person. It says, a lot of Jewish anti-Zionist organising is happening separately from Palestinian organising. Do you see potential for more overlap developing? Yes. Uh... I think this is such a good question. I mean, I think that overlap is happening and I think more can happen. And I also think sometimes it's okay for Jewish anti-Zionist organizing to, to, to be focused on Jewish communities. And that doesn't mm -hmm. always have to be the role that Palestinian organizing should have to take on. And so I think sometimes it's like, we wanna remind ourselves that it's a, it's a yes and, there's a, there's a multiplicity and diversity of tactics that we need all of it. We need, we need, Jewish anti-Zionist organizing speaking as itself. And we also need deep coalitional um, visible actions that aren't just behind the scenes coalitional, but are actually visibly coalitional. Um, and I think what we've seen over the past couple of months is so much more Palestinian led actions and Jews and non-Palestinians flanking Palestinians. And that really is our job is to flank Palestinians and to say, we are going to show up and we're going to put our bodies on the line and we're going to refuse the narrative that 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 Jews aren't here and that that we're going to ref we're going to refuse the smearing of this. Um, and so I think there's, you know, the the Palestinian youth movement has been organizing these these regular shut it down actions that I know have been coordinated internationally. And it's been so powerful to see tons of spontaneous, or not spontaneous, autonomous actions um, emerge that are deeply in coalition. Um, and at the core, I believe, even if you don't see, like, like um, we're, the movement is one body, the movement, the movement is, the movement is, is, is like, different parts of it get to show up visibly in different moments. And we get to, we have to listen and say, what is required in this moment? Is this, a, is this a moment that's required for us to speak as Jews? Or is this a moment where it's like, actually get in line and flank Palestinians in this moment? Mm, amazing. So we're almost at the end. So I'm gonna ask one more kind of round up question. This has been the most beautiful and rich conversation. I feel so privileged and so blessed to be part of this with you. But um, I guess I wanted to kind of round up on a like positive, future focused kind of note. Um, and I wondered, you know, how has yeah anti-racist um, and anti-Zionist organizing changed like since you've been organizing? Um, how has the movement changed and what what do you see for like the future of 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 this kind of organizing and and well, liberation as as Jews and as uh, Palestinians as oppressed people yeah i wondered if you could maybe round up on that on that note first of all i'm just so grateful for this conversation with you and for your like brilliant questions and insights and i'm just really grateful for this space and this itself gives me a glimmer of that world to come that you also talk about in your book of rehearsing for the world to come you know like um and i think in response to your question 
what has been unleashed in Jews will never be put back. The, our anti-Zionism that has been unleashed, which is another way of saying our commitment to collective liberation, will never be put back in the box. You cannot unsee what you have now seen. Mm. And this is something I love about Jews. <laughs> you know, like we, don't, don't tell us to, that we haven't seen that we saw it, you know? And so no matter when you arrived to this consciousness, you can never unsee what you saw now. And I think what has been unleashed among young people, the questioning, the fierce commitment to solidarity can never be put away and can never be contained. And so that gives me hope. Right now at Brown University in Rhode Island, there are students on hunger strike. There are 19 students on hunger strike, both Jews and Palestinians who are saying, we want this university to divest from Israel now. Those students are, are meeting, the Jewish students are meeting every Friday and they're having Shabbat together and they are studying their texts together. That gives me so much hope because what they are doing is paving the way for future generations and can never be undone, can never be hidden, can never be put back in the box. You can no longer say, you can no longer you erase our history from us. They are rescuing our most radical liberatory histories and advancing it forward. And so, um, and, and, and let's be honest, who's doing this? It's the queers, it's the feminists, it's the trans people, you know, like, let's be honest, who's always holding down our movements, you know? <laughs> so our movements are deeply, are, are, are the, the, this, the movements that we're building, that we're, are deeply intersectional and want a world where everybody is free. And I'm so excited to see people demand a Judaism beyond Zionism and to, and to say that we will not, we will not abandon Palestinians now or ever. Amazing. Thank you so much. And yeah, I feel that I get, I think I started organizing as an anti-Zionist Jew maybe 20 years ago and it felt very lonely in those days and it does not feel lonely anymore saying Baruch Hashem because <laughs> honestly the the more crowded this movement gets the more vibes it gets <laughs> that's right <laughs> Do you know what I mean that's right it's amazing to see and like there is a lot of there's a lot to be hopeful about every time we come out onto the streets and we see new faces more people um joining joining the struggle and so yeah I just want to say a massive thank you so much for uh being with us here today Morgan you have been our 10 out of 10 person <laughs> to have this conversation with like I've loved every moment of it I'm going to be look, looking back over the recording over and over again for like all of the talking points that we we covered um but yeah I hope this is the start of uh, a beautiful friendship across the pond yes. um yes yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> i can't i can't wait and to keep building together and thank you so much for all the work you're doing for this space okay thank you so much